So welcome to the session on uh, VMware vCenter Capacity IQ. My name is Hemant Kaidani, and I'm part of the technical marketing group at VMware. And uh, I have with me uh, Sam McBride, who is the architect on the Capacity IQ product. Uh, just one quick reminder, uh, we do have, I mean, I've been told you need to fill out the surveys, so if possible, you can do it from your laptops, you can do it from your uh, PDAs as well, so do uh, try to fill in the surveys at the end of the session here. This slide does apply to this session here, because today we are going to actually uh, show you the new features in the Capacity IQ 1.5 release. Uh, we have had Capacity IQ 1.0. Uh, in the market for about a year. So 1.0 was released uh, last, October, lo last October in 2009. And uh, by the end of this year, we are actually re uh, ready to launch 1.5. So I'll be talking about the new features in that release. The pricing and the packaging is not yet determined, even if it is. I don't know that because it's above my pay grade. So what I'm going to do today is give you a very high level overview of capacity management. Uh, then talk about the, the use cases we had in mind when we launched Capacity IQ last year. I'll go through the new features that we are coming up with in 1.5, <clears throat> and then Sam will get into the, the deep dive into how Capacity IQ actually analyzes the, the data and does the trending and forecasting and how we actually come up with the, the capacity optimization reports that we have in the product. So at a very high level, I have this couple slides that try to set the context here. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about cloud computing. So cloud computing, as they say, is the, the new era. And essentially what it is trying to do is uh, set up IT as a service now. So with virtualization, what we have done is we have essentially enabled, uh, we have shared multiple resources you know, across uh, various servers, various uh, storage uh, backend systems. And you have a res uh, pool of resources with which you are basically building your virtual data centers there. And the idea is that once you start with the, the, the cost savings uh, proposition, and essentially you are moving to this IT as a service proposition where you are now basically focusing on your application services and you know, the SLAs that you have in place there. Uh, what we're doing further now is actually extending this to public clouds where you are you know, working with service providers. So the ultimate nirvana here is you can actually seamlessly move your applications from the private cloud to the public cloud and back and forth, basically. However, to do that, you obviously realize that there are challenges with management and security as well. I mean, there are a lot of issues that have been raised around that. For this session specifically, I have listed the management challenges that are out there. So, I mean, you have to deal with, you know, a different uh, set of providers there. Uh, whether it's a public cloud, what the hardware, what resources the service provider has versus what you have in your virt internal virtual data center. You have to make sure that the management tools that you have now actually can work with the cloud computing architecture. If you look at it, traditionally you had these vertical silos, whether they were departmental based, whether they were based on the applications, uh, whether they were based on your locations. Uh, you had these vertical stacks of application, and your management tools were really optimized to just go against that vertical stack. With virtualization, once we have this you know, shared pool of resources, you are essentially now talking about horizontal layers now instead of the vertical silos there. So your management tools need to adapt themselves to actually work with this kind of environment there. So that's a challenge that you have to face. And then again, you have to, I mean, the manageability aspect also extends to the application mobility. I mean, as the applications are seamlessly moving in and out of the cloud, you need to be able to manage that with your application service levels that you have in place. And also there is issues with security and compliance uh, that you also have to manage uh, when you are working in both private and public clouds there. So to address that, what we are doing at VMware is essentially we are now looking at management. We are trying to address the management issues in this you know, what, uh, horizontal layers, actually. So at the bottom of it, we actually have management for infrastructure and operations. So here we are trying to address the various service levels that are associated with uh, availability and performance, uh, with business continuity, with configuration issues, capacity is one of them, and then things like provisioning and compliance and security stuff. We then move up the, the value chain, and we talk about management at the application layer. 
So this is where we talk about you know, application provisioning. We talk about uh, discovering where the applications are running in your environment and how they are connected with each other. What are the dependencies out there? So we talk about that. And finally, managing the application performance service levels. So if you heard about App Speed or if you heard about Application Discovery Manager, those are the, the tools that we're talking about there for application management. And at the top of it is the end user computing. I mean, we've heard about you know, all the different devices and all the, the things that Steve was talking about and what needs to be addressed in that space. So uh, VMware View or you know, the tools that will be addressing those space, I mean, again, the administration, the deployment, as well as uh, you know, all the compliance issues that have to be addressed in that space there. So for this session, again, uh, we are just going to focus on capacity. That's essentially what Capacity IQ is trying to address here. Uh, how do you actually manage and optimize capacity in your cloud environment? Now, capacity management as such is not a new thing. I mean, you've been doing capacity management even in your physical environment. I mean, there's been there, like, right from the mainframe world, I mean, people have been trying to do capacity planning, planning their hardware refreshes and all those things. What is interesting in virtual environment is, are those capacity management tools actually able to manage all the nuances that you have in the virtual environment? And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the, the optimizations that are in place in the hypervisor. So I have listed a few things here. So for example, I mean, do the management tools actually take into account vMotion or storage vMotion, the load balancing that DRS does for your workloads? Uh, does it take into account the optimizations that are there in the hypervisor for memory, like page sharing, ballooning, and things like that? Uh, vSphere also has things like shares, limits, reservations that lets you uh, monitor the resources that you give to your virtual machines. So does your uh, capacity management tool actually take into account that as well? So there are a lot of these optimizations that are there. And again, these are just the things in the vSphere. I'm sure there are stuff in the, the backend storage systems, like the deduping and stuff like that. Uh, so everybody in the stack is going to have their optimizations. Does the capacity, uh, do the capacity management tools you have actually take those into account? Because if you don't, you are going to end up with over-provisioning. You are going to end up with conservative estimates. And that's essentially you know, what really needs to be addressed now. As the customers are moving through their virtualization journey, what we have seen is, you know, beyond a particular point, like if they start, you know, going beyond 10, 12 vSphere host, you know, 100 VMs, and uh, they start asking us questions, uh, you know, about their capacity. They want to have better visibility into their existing capacity. How am I using my existing capacity? How many more VMs can I add? You know, when will I run out of capacity? They want to actually have answers for those things. The other common thing is, uh, you know, I'm sure every app owner basically comes to you and says, I want a 4 vCPU VM. I want a 4 gigs or 8 gigs of VM. Everybody wants, you know, over-provisioned VMs there. The actual utilization is hardly anything, but then when you want to provision them, everybody is asking you for large VMs. Does the VI admin have any tool, you know, where he can actually look at the reports, he can take that evidence back to the app owners and say that, you know, you guys are really using only so much CPU or so much memory. You don't need these large VMs. So can we actually make more efficient use of the existing capacity? Uh, you know, there are probably idle VMs. There are powered off VMs. Can we, you know, delete those VMs or can we at least archive those VMs? I mean, how do I identify those things? So those are another, you know, uh, questions that we are getting. And finally, there is the, the ability to predict, you know, what's going to happen in the future. So for example, you have this end of quarter you know, processing that you have to do and you have to bring 20 more VMs online. Uh, do you actually have capacity to uh, provision those 20 VMs? Uh, when will you run out of capacity? If you have a hardware refresh in place, I mean, if you're going to add like the newer you know, MMU enabled processors, if you're going to you know, update the memory on the, pro uh, on the existing host, do you actually, I mean, how does that affect your capacity? So all these questions are now you know, commonly coming up, and, and that's essentially what we are trying to address with Capacity IQ. So before I you know, give, uh, give you the overview of Capacity IQ, I mean, how are you, you know, doing these things today? So as we went around asking customers, I mean, the most common answer we got is, oh, we just you know, use rules of thumb. 
So, uh, you know, we have somebody who has gone through the pain in the past. You've probably gone through some downtime or you've probably gone to, you know, some issues in the past. And then you basically just base your estimates, you know, based on that. Uh, they are naturally conservative. You're trying to play safe there. That's probably the best, you know, most organizations are doing today. The second thing, if you have the resources, if you have the skills in-house, we have a lot of customers who have also gone and tried to do their own homegrown solutions. So people have pulled the data from the vCenter database. They have populated that in the Excel spreadsheets, and then they have tried to you know, create all these fancy charts and you know, models that you know, they can do. Some of them have also used SQL scripts. So you have the database views for the vCenter database. So some of them have used that to actually pull the data. And then there are others who have actually done the, the VI SDK. So if you have the Perl toolkit, if you have the Power CLI, you actually use that to pull the data there. There are, I mean, obviously at least a couple of issues with that. The, the first thing is your uh, data that you get is basically a static snapshot in time. So whenever you pull it, the frequency at which you pull that data, that's basically, you know, what are the information that you have. And the second thing is, you are responsible for maintaining that. So if, you know, the developer or the script writer who is in-house, he probably lives, then you are with, you know, on your own to actually maintain those things. So these are the issues that, you know, obviously yeah, that you have to deal with. And so even the customers who are actually having these solutions in-house, they came to VMware and they said, why don't you actually do this? You know, why don't you just build something on your own which will take into account all the optimizations that vSphere is doing? as well as, you know, we don't have to worry about maintaining and rewriting those scripts and the, the SQL queries that we have. And that was, that was basically the, the premise for, you know, start, uh, to start working on capacity IQ there. So, as I said before, those, the, 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 the questions that we had earlier, I mean, on the earlier slide, that's essentially what we try to do with capacity IQ. Provide you the visibility, uh, provide you uh, the areas where you can actually make more efficient use of your capacity, as well as provide you some what-if scenarios so that you can do some modeling, both for the VMs as well as for the, the hardware that you can add to your environment there. Now, what Capacity IQ does essentially is it pulls the data from the vCenter database, uh, and it regularly pulls it, it continuously pulls it. Once the appliance is turned on, it basically pulls it on an ongoing basis, and then it does trending and forecasting based on that. So uh, we've already have customers, as I said, uh, the product was launched last year. We have had several customers who have gone through POCs, several customers who are actually, I mean, very happy with the product. And this is uh, one of the slides where, you know, one of our, uh, after the POC, one of our customers came up with this report on um, the uh, optimization opportunities they have in their environment. You can see there that over 90% of their VMs were over-provisioned. And this is, again, I'm sure this is something that you run into as well, because everybody just wants to have large VM. There's another customer here. When they did their initial analysis and they looked at the oversize, undersize, you know, the, the idle VMs, and, uh, they basically you know, realized that in, during their initial analysis, they can actually save $3 million based on the, the, uh, the operating system licenses, the, the application licenses they actually had to purchase. So here is a quick overview on Capacity IQ. Essentially what it does is it provides you three different views. There is dashboard, which is for you know, the quick analysis, quick report on how you are doing with your capacity. Then there is multiple views that you know, let you drill down into the various aspects of capacity. And finally, you have some pre-canned reports at this time that you can you know, run at regular intervals and you can actually you know, send it off to your management. As far as the dashboard goes, we actually present the data in two ways. Uh, the first and the foremost thing is uh, we obviously provide the raw data. So we provide you the CPU, memory, the storage, you know, disk I.O., network I.O. data, the raw data which is there. There are also people who want to abstract that data to a higher level. Because they think that the, the resource metrics in itself is probably meaningless. All they need to do is, okay, how many more VMs can I add? When will I run out of capacity? So what Capacity IQ also does is we take that raw data and we analyze that and we'll actually abstract it to a higher level to tell you the number of VMs that you can add 
and the time remaining you have. So you run out of capacity in maybe 15 days, six months, one year. So we provide you uh, data around that. And we have different perspectives there. We, you know, it, it will report on the capacity deployed as well as the capacity remaining. So various different views that you have to report on that one. We also do capacity modeling, both on the capacity side as well as on the demand side. So on the capacity side, what I mean by that is if you are going to add a vSphere host, if you're going to actually uh, go through a hardware refresh, add more memory or add more processors, we let you model that. We also model on the demand side, basically how many more VMs you are going to add in your environment or the VMs that you are going to review, remove. So we let you model on that one as well. And while we are doing that, we also take into account uh, the HA calculations, the HA uh, rules that you have in place. So the percentage capacity set for failover or the number of hosts that you have set for HA failure. We take into account all of that when you do this modeling. So these are just a couple screenshots here. As I said, we do it you know, both on the host side, that is the, the capacity side, as well as on the VM side there. And the third use case that we've tried to uh, address is the capacity optimization. I've already mentioned before the optimization report that you get uh, from Capacity IQ. So what we do here is provide you a bunch of reports on uh, how many idle and powered off VMs that you have, uh, how many oversized or undersized VMs you have. When you have oversized VMs, we also recommend you know, what is the actual size that you should have, how many number of CPUs or how many uh, how much memory you should have for your uh, for your VMs there. So Capacity IQ 1.0 was released last October, and what it did was it did trending and forecasting based on CPU and memory. So one of the big things after we released that was everybody wanted you know all the analysis based on storage. So the focus for 1.5 is essentially to add support for the data stores for the backend storage that you have. So with 1.5, you can now do trending and forecasting based on the storage. So we do both the storage IOPS as well as the actual disk space that you are using. We also do what if scenarios now they have been updated to include uh, the, the storage or the data stores in there. So uh, that's the big request. That was the number one request that we had from customers, and that's essentially what we are trying to address with 1.5. The second thing that we also heard about was the reports, the pre-canned reports that we had. In 1.0, you could only run them on demand. That is, you just run them now. You cannot schedule them. So in 1.5 now, you have the ability to schedule your reports. And I'll have a screenshot uh, in a later slide. Uh, Capacity IQ uses the existing utilization to do the trending and forecasting. So your forecasting is only good if your data is good. I mean, you know, you have, if you have outliers that can very easily skew your trending and uh, your trend lines. So one of the things that we have now done in 1.5 is a better handling of outlier data. So you can actually ignore some of the outlier data that you think is going to skew your, uh, the trend lines. Just like we have under-provisioned and over-provisioned VMs, in 1.5, we also added feature to identify stressed vSphere host or <coughs> underutilized vSphere host. So that way you can then balance your workload across your vSphere host. You can you know, balance the, the actual utilization of the resources. And as usual, there are improvements in the, the scalability performance area, in the usability area, uh, bug fixes, and things like that. So these are a couple of screenshots here. Uh, the, the, the top one here basically tells you that when you're doing capacity analysis, you now have an option to choose which performance metrics you want to go after. So you can just do analysis based on CPU or disk I.O. or just memory. You can pick and choose what you want to do. And likewise, uh, the second one here shows you that you can set capacity buffer. Most IT organizations usually have you know, some reserve capacity in place, you know, 10% or 20% CPU or memory. So Capacity IQ also allows you to do that. So you actually can set those numbers there. In fact, there is a, a lot of knobs in Capacity IQ and the global settings that you can play with, and that will give you different results. You know, that you, know, you can actually pick and choose whatever reflects your environment more accurately. 
And this is the screenshot here for the, the report scheduling. Again, you can see that we have added feature where you can now specify the start date, the time, the day of the week where the reports need to be run. And if you also have an email server set up, you can actually send emails, uh, send the report uh, you know, to specific email IDs there. So before I hand over to Sam, I just want to put this slide up here just to give you a quick review of what we have done so far. So 1.0 released uh, last year, you know, had the dashboards, the, the what-if modeling, and the, the capacity efficiency views, uh, also the pre-canned reports. With 1.0.4, uh, because 4.1 is already released, we also had this request to actually have a dot release that supports 4.1. So if you already have uh, 1.0 in-house, you can actually upgrade to 1.0.4. Uh, that way we support you know, the 4.1 metrics and the 4.1 data there. And 1.5 is uh, scheduled for end of the year. We are actually going to just about start the private beta for the product, and it should be out uh, by the end of the year. So any quick questions before I hand it over to Sam? OK, all yours. Thanks. Come on. No questions yet? Everybody know what capacity is? One dot five is is what? One dot oh four is compatible with vSphere four dot one and four and uh, two and this one's four and four one. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. So again, you guys know what capacity. He said it a lot of times today. So uh, our product is about capacity management. It's not a ops management play. So uh, we analyze capacity, and, and to, to do that, we have to figure out what it means to you. And when you use things like HA or this buffer that he just mentioned, we have to take in those, uh, those settings to, uh, to derate it. And then when we add up the usage or analyze the usage or the load, uh, we we compare it to that either usable capacity or the actual capacity, depending on what, what your goal is. And so it looks like this. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. But these are the key concepts. And when you look at the, the charts and graphs and the global settings inside of the, of the product, you'll want to take into account that sometimes it'll look like your usage is actually going above capacity, and that's because reserve capacity is more of a policy than actual capacity. And we have two types of capacity that we analyze, and one is uh, the virtual capacity for a VM configuration, and then the cluster capacity or host capacity, the actual capacity. Another thing that we've come up with is just break it down, instead of breaking it down per CPU, memory, disk I.O., disk space, and then you having to look at all these lines and data uh, and, and see which one runs out first, we've, we've come up with a way to do, express this in terms of VM. So this is a, a common question when you go to a meeting and they say, well, you know, I have a, a 3,000 gigahertz left and I've got uh, another uh, terabytes of memory and so forth, and then they just say, what, what does that mean? And so based on your average VM that you're deploying, they just want to know how many VMs that, that means. So we've come up with a way to calculate VM capacity in terms of the unit of VM, and then we compare, uh, show deployed versus remaining. Like that. All right. So to calculate the average VM, you have to look at all these compute dimensions of CPU memory and disk I.O. and disk space. And you also have to define the scope of your population. So we calculate, a, we, um, for each level, object level, whether it be a data center, a cluster, a host, we calculate the average VM of that population that's selected. So if the, the higher you go up, the more your population is, is dispersed, like uh, you see here. You see a small, medium, large. This is just a, one way to look at it. You can 
you can have so many configurations. Uh, but then we, calc we uh, use that input for this average VM, and that is what determines uh, the amount of VM count capacity you have. All right, that's a lot of capacity. And this is what it looks like in the product. So there's a, there's a view that, that you can click to. We have dashboards, views, and reports. And you can go to this view and look at the, uh, what we estimate as the average VM. Before I go into this, this well, just, this is, it looks real simple. A bunch of dots with a line. The line intersects capacity. And when that runs out, that is called time remaining. Uh, well, that's, that, that's out, of your, out of capacity. But there's two dimensions here. One is remaining capacity and then time remaining. And what I like about this graph is that when you're looking at a, a trend line and you want to look at the capacity uh, remaining or time remaining, you'll pick an interval, say a daily interval or a weekly interval, and that will pull up an average. Then you fit that average uh, with a regression. And then wherever that lands in the future is going to be uh, your, where you're concerned. So, there's waves, there's natural waves in, in usage, right? Every week we go into work, we uh, start up our computers. If you're running VDI, this will look different. So setting that interval is important for whatever you're concerned with of when you want to solve the problem. So if you're looking at quarter to quarter data, uh, you, you know, if that's the way your business works, you want to set that interval to that. Same with remaining capacity. Remaining capacity, if I just did it for this particular instance, that, that would give me one answer. But if you looked at how much my slope is, I could, I, I could also use a four-week average and take the average of that data and would be much smaller. So you have the ability to uh, not use this trend line for estimating remaining capacity, but uh, a, a window of usage. So if you want to capture a few different cycles, a waves, you want to widen that window. If you feel that your growth curve is aggressive, then you want to shorten that window so that you can uh, not have this old history distorting the facts. All right. I'm going to skip this one. And that, that's setting those settings. So Hamant said we have a dashboard, we have views, and we have reports, and now we have scheduled reports. That is all arranged to uh, kind of lead you into the art of capacity management, which is identify problems, and those two problems are capacity remaining today or this week, or time remaining, which helps you with a provisioning process. To so solve that, in the old day, it would be just get more capacity. Actually, today it's similar to that uh, as well. What we wanted to do is help bring some controls in to give you other options. And those options are to find waste in your environment. And those waste, environment, waste in your environment is uh, idle VMs, powered off VMs, and oversized VMs. So we've added a, uh, a few controls. This particular control that we're looking at right now is to help find that problem. Uh, you, can, you can change the way that we forecast that this is a time remaining problem. You can change the buffer and some other calculation, rules calculations. On the forecast, you can use different uh, smooth functions for fit. You can use an automatic, and it will pick the best fit. And then uh, it'll tell you if you're uh, on an exponential growth or a linear growth. And uh, this automatic is per compute dimension, so it'll be if your CPU is growing linear but your uh, memory is growing exponential, it'll fit it. The buffer, uh, this is, uh, like Hamant said, it's very simple to enter it in. People use HA, this would be on top of HA. And what I usually recommend is to turn this off because when you're looking uh, in the beginning, turn it off. And the reason is, is when you're looking at the product in the, in the beginning, you want to get, you know, get your bearings right. You don't want these uh, things to say, 
I have negative VMs remaining when uh, this is set at 30%. So since this is on top of HA rules, you might want to leave this at zero and then grow it as you learn the product. We, uh, we also look at modeling usage behavior. I talked about uh, the weekly cycles and, and so forth. One, weekly, one usage behavior that we like to model is this typical week. So we store all of our data in a typical week. This means 168 data points for 7 by 24, and, with that, and that pattern survives every single roll-up. So if you have weekly data and you roll it up to uh, monthly, it'll take those four weeks in a grid, stack them on top, and for the month, you'll know what the typical 8 a.m. at Monday would look like. What's nice about that is we can put controls like this in it, where you can define your SLA, uh, your business window or business week. And this will weed out uh, things like uh, you know, batch processes that happen in the, in the background, backups, or whatever kind of compute intensive. It also remove, if, you, if on the weekend on the meet, uh, maintenance window, or what you call off hours, is idle, you don't want that, that time to bring down your, your business week average where you need that SLA. So we have controls to do that. Okay. So the idle VMs, this is what it, uh, the screen looks like. There's uh, idle and powered off. These are the two types of waste. Idle VMs, of course, are VMs that are, were requested, deployed, and left uh, kind of orphaned, but they're still running. Powered off VMs were requested, deployed, probably powered on once, and then powered off and forgotten about. So these are the two types of ways that give you a lot of return. Uh, disk space being one of them. It's a, uh, we've seen customers save a lot of money by finding idle VMs. I mean, powered off VMs. Powered off VM calculation is quite simple. It's our simplest uh, calculation. It's just Boolean. It can be powered on or off. And it's, uh, you give it a, a four-week range or however long you want to analyze. And it'll give you a short list of VMs that we're off 20% of the time, or 10%, or 100%. You know, you can, you can take it anywhere in that range. Idle VMs is the next level up. You set a noise level for these compute dimensions. We only picked uh, CPU, disk I.O., and network I.O. We didn't include memory because memory is, uh, it can idle full. So there's no sense. It's not a rate calculation. It's a consumption calculation. So these all kind of indicate work. And if a machine's not working, it's probably idle. And uh, we, uh, if, as long as the usage goes, when the usage is above the threshold, that's how we calculate the percentage of the time that it was idle, or below, if it remains below. So you can have this and or or. So if any of the uh, thresholds are idle, or if uh, all of them are idle. Another thing that this can help you with with this any and or is uh, capacity unbalance, imbalance, right? So if you have too much CPU and not enough disk I.O., you know, it can, it can help with those. And this is uh, oversized and undersized. This is our, uh, this is the right sizing of VM. It, it does play a little bit into the uh, getting, reclaiming capacity, um, but it's, it's more probably just a, a healthy environment exercise as well. Your customer will be happy if they have a right size VM. This will be, uh, even an oversized VM will r sometimes run poorly because of the way that the scheduler has to schedule all the vCPUs and there's not enough room. So you'll have a, a population of VMs that are trying to fight for these physical uh, CPUs and the only reason is because they have too much uh, too many vCPUs allocated. And the best thing to do is to bring that down, get them to the right size, what they need. And uh, you can see from this chart what we do is we show you what it, what it is, and then we recommend a new one, both in the uh, CPU and memory. Oversized VM calculation is 
oversized and undersized calculations are very similar. Oversized is, uh, again, the waste, uh, uh, waste zone is down at the bottom. You create a threshold, which is kind of like a percentile analysis. And we, we uh, analyze the area that is used versus not used, and we express that as how wasteful it is. All right. This is a, a good example of two different VM profiles. Uh, you have one that has the uh, area that it's a little lower. And what's significant in this chart is that if you just did time-based analysis, these both would look identical. If you just said, okay, what is the, percent of the percentage of the time that it was oversized, you would get the same uh, percentage. But since we do this area analysis, you get different results. All right. I'm going to pause and we can talk about this in a, as soon as I get through some of these slides. So undersized VMs are the, are the inverse. And it's, we define at the top an area of stress. And when the usage goes uh, above the threshold, we start uh, adding up the area. And then the usage area above the threshold is compared to the total area of the box, and that's percent stress, which is unhappy. And then this, uh, this example shows the difference between two potential VMs. One is very kind of responsive. It has a different load characteristic, and the other is more of a throughput. And from this graph, if you had a threshold, all you, if you were just saying, okay, let me put a threshold here and see if it, uh, and use that type of mechanism to calculate its happiness, then it, this spiky one is going to bug you all day long, right? And it's not indicative of that it's a really unhappy VM because it's the width of the uh, wave, waveform that is kind of applied to your SLA criteria. In our approach, we, we use the area method, and what that gives us is uh, the ability to uh, quantify these as, as stressed out regardless of the waveform, which is kind of nice. And I think that's, uh, that's it. So as a summary, I, was, uh, I went through a lot here, and uh, it's kind of important when you're looking at uh, new terms and such, like oversized, undersized, and idle, and powered off, that you, you kind of see where, why we put them in. Uh, you know, looking at just finding stress or finding problems is half, half the point of having a capacity management tool. Uh, we wanted to add opportunities, and those opportunities are, are in this calculation. We spent a lot of time looking at this, uh, this area. So if you have questions about uh, how oversized and undersized works, uh, I'd be happy to take them. Or if you want to know about disk I.O. and topologies and so forth, that'd be great. Quick, quick note, actually. So if, if you want to hear about customers who are using this product and you know, what their experience is, there is actually a session at noon. Uh, MA9789, so we have a uh, customer panel, uh, customers talking about their experience with the product. Shoot. Shoot. Can I slide back for a moment? Sure. Yeah. Is Just there any there, plans yeah. on the roadmap to support other hypervisors? Are there any plans on the roadmap to support other hypervisors? Uh, the answer is, uh, <laughs> according to Paul's keynote, yes. Uh, so I will go where he leads. So. <laughs> so yes, the question is, I mean, when do we do training based on networks? So we already have the data there. It's just a matter of you know adding it. So uh, the release after 1.5 that would be one of the top items there. So I think the question was, can I combine application usage with VM usage to get a total picture? Is that, is that right? Uh, if you saw the Integrian Alive uh, announcement, those guys can take data 
sources from anywhere, uh, Hyperic being one, and also uh, BC. So there is there are ways to do that. For capacity analysis, the application uh, usage or bottleneck at the application level isn't quite in the game of capacity. We right. So configuration analysis and, and those kinds of things, it does make a difference, especially when you uh, application configuration. And yeah. I think... I think you'll see it because we can also feed our capacity information into a live for VM. So this, uh, you know, the art of doing ops management with thresholds and the art of doing capacity management of right sizing and then the art of doing configuration management, they all kind of similar things. Some are identify problems and then some our root cause to that symptom. You know, it might be a symptomatic problem. It could be a configuration that causes the performance issue. And then you want to get into the, where do I, where do I find opportunities to solve my problem? That could be a configuration. It could be capacity. It could be uh, uh, some kind of kill a process. So configuration management and capacity management will merge together. I got, I got a bunch. Go ahead. It's for the storage metrics are for hosts and VMs. They're in the read. Uh, we do we separate read and writes, and we also include response time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Paired VMs like uh, FT or like SRM and stuff like. Right, right. So we don't today. Uh, there is a lot of technology in VMware that creates a shadow VM uh, in, in to, to, to make their product work, like SRM does it, FT does it. And we'll get to the point where you can tag VMs or there'll be other qualifiers for VMs and we'll treat them differently. But right now, everything is just a VM to us. The good news is, is in cases like VDI, VDM, when a VM is deployed and dis uh, go, uh, is, we call it born or uh, deployed and then destroyed, which is a, a typical VDI use case, uh, we see that. VC would destroy the data. As soon as the VM goes away, the performance data goes away, and so does its inventory. Uh, CIQ, this is one of the reasons why we collect the data from VC and store it in our own is that we need to know about topology movements over time. We need to know about those objects that were created and destroyed. We want to profile them so that you can get an average VM. Uh, this is uh, the same use case for development and test. They deploy a lot of VMs, destroy them, and, and, and so forth. And then we also want to know about that, what caused, you could see the load to the host, but you can't see the causation if you destroy those performance. So we, we keep track of all that. So to actually add to that, so on, on the VDI case especially, I mean, people always, I mean, they, they leverage link clones. So, you know, when we added the support for storage, we do have uh, support for features like thick provisioning, thin provisioning, link clones. So the optimizations that, you know, we do on the storage side. Yeah, we have that. Uh, I'm gonna, In integration then. with the cloud collector, uh, director, or like a, uh, an API so I can process both, you can say, is there capacity? And if there is, right. So we've already started work on a uh, API. We have a customer using it for a workflow type engine. Uh, that is a good use case. We have some other use cases for reporting or for uh, some stuff, but uh, first we have to build an official API and then uh, vCloud will take advantage of it, director. But it's not there yet. Right. 
So it was, uh, it's one of the features we're tracking, is the ability to persist. We, uh, Haman showed a what-if scenario, I think. Yeah, we just have school. So there's a what-if scenario, and what that allows you to do is, what if I deploy 20 VMs, or what if I add capacity? What, how does that change my environment? Right now, that is, tre uh, is treated as like a one-time stimulus. You know, it, it, it creates a cliff, and then it recalculates your slope, and, and, and so forth. There's a desire to do a few things. One is calcu uh, uh, put, persist that, those with us in a recurring uh, scenario that represents a, uh, what I think will happen. And then you compare your actual against what you thought would happen. Another is I, want, I know about all these projects, and I'm using a project manager, and I want to I put those in and see, see how it'll change. Uh, we have to kind of work through all those use cases because it's, kind of, it's complicated. When you're combining organic growth with something you think will happen and it didn't happen, and then it becomes a mess because, you know, you got all these uh, projects in there and they didn't, they didn't quite equal what you want. Uh, we're, we're thinking about it, but, yeah, it's, it's something that customers want. So vApps uh, is kind of a new thing for VMware, relatively new. I mean, when you look, talk to an engineer, you know, it just showed up yesterday, even though it was a year ago, because I got your projects. But uh, we want to, uh, they have cool dependencies and, and stuff that we can analyze using uh, their, using their dependencies, we can create a group called a vApp. Uh, we don't do that today. We want to, uh, we want to actually, uh, include any kind of group that you want to create, like be it a department and, and some other stuff. So we want to do that. It's got a yellow shirt. So the raw data, uh, the, the initial raw data is kept up to one year. And then when we roll it up, we keep rolling it up, and then that's 10 years. And uh, it's quite a bit. And what's, again, what I like about what we chose is that it preserves that business week profile. Eventually, we'd probably get into other profiles, like typical month of the year, you know. Yeah. yeah so yeah, we, we don't do the, the VC roll-ups are different. So, I mean, we need to maintain the granularity. And so that's why we, Capacity IQ has its own uh, database and has its own granularity there. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, we get, we actually talk a lot about how much data is needed to do proper capacity analysis. And my response is always, it, it really depends how long you're going to work there. <laughs> because if you're going to be there for uh, even four years and you think of what can happen, like uh, that causes a business usage to go down. We have another product called Capacity Planner, and what we built that product right post uh, the 2000, the dot-com crash, and then the, the Twin Towers thing. So the economy went really south, and we built that to help people consolidate, and uh, we use VMware to, to get that even further so that they, their capital that they had, and their data centers were shrinking, and so forth. What was interesting about that exercise is that we kept, we still have data from 2000, and we see that compute performance follows economic times as well. You know, the more people you have, and so forth. So if you're going to try to try to uh, model that as well as just a user behavior. It, it, it depends on how aggressive you want to be. So that's why I say, you know, seasonality, like December's and, and, and so forth, peak months, uh, depending on your business. Uh, the weekly profile, this is, this is a no-brainer. You can be successful because all people are habitual creatures. They come in at a certain time and Go to meeting. Some people go to meetings all day long, and some people don't. So uh, you can profile those guys and get them the right VM they they need, and 
and, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, the average, that's the law of average. You know, it, you love it and you hate it because uh, queuing theory uses it because if you're looking at the problem too closely, you get yourself in trouble. So you got to average it out and back away and, and quantify it that way. But when you get too big and you get an average that's not representative of a wavelength that you want, and that's why people come to me and go, I need to, I need to do capacity management based on peak. Sam, I need peak. I'm like, okay, so what are you trying to, I go, you just gave me a solution to a problem that's in your head. And you've solved it by using a peak analysis. And uh, I know there's some companies that every Monday or Sunday, all of a sudden they got a website that just, just uh, goes, and they have to optimize for that one peak and not for the rest of the time. So response time is important. Well, that's what virtualization is about, right? You put those guys with other guys that peak at different times and everybody's happy. That's why we did that. You know, it, it's like uh, the mainframe coming back again uh, to me. It's... You, you had to build a box, a physical box, for its peak load. Now you've got physical boxes that are way bigger than any one peak load, and you just you put all those little guys together, and you get an average load. It's, that's the beauty of virtualization, right? Uh, does the tool identify uh, orphan storage? Orphan VMDKs? Yes. Yeah. So we don't directly do... Orphan VMDKs, we were going to put it as an item, but what we have is other space. So we break it down by used VM, uh, used in uh, VMDK, total usage, VMDK usage of VMs that are running. And then we have other. And the reason why we pick that first is because v Orphan VMDKs is one type of trash that you need to clean up, but there are log files and a significant other snapshots and all kinds of stuff that we need to get down. And right now, our UI, we don't have a, a, a good breakdown, like a stacked graph, uh, but we can show uh, you know, simple stuff. We're going to improve that, but right now, it's in that category of, of trash you need to take out, essentially. There is a view in there uh, for the data stores that actually gives you those categorizations. So you should, uh, Right. Bad. Yeah. We don't look inside uh, the VM. We do use active memory for our memory demand, but we massage it a little. What we do is uh, active memory is a moving average, and we use a peak of the moving average over a certain amount of time, and we add an additional unswappable memory that is used for kernel driver. We estimate the amount of memory that's needed for a VM. That's why using active memory alone is, is not quite right. So we've created a memory demand that combines a few items, and then that memory demand is used in our over and under our stress zone, so we do area analysis on that, that metric. CPU is the same way. You can't just go by CPU ready alone. And we used to get this question a lot, you know, how much ready is good or bad? And it's always been, when you talk about memory and CPU and, and uh, like paging, 
It's all about feel speed, right? It's about response time. And there's a golden rule that says I can, I can survive one page fault per 2.5 million memory reads to get 10% degradation in response time. And that's just a ratio between the, the disk, IO, disk response time and a typical memory response time. So CPU ready is the same thing. You have to put it in relative to its usage. So if it's more than 10% of its usage, then you might feel, it may feel something, right? So we, we've come up with something called CPU demand, which just combines usage and, and uh, ready. And uh, it plots that in that same typical, the same format that I said of memory demand. So both those together will give you a better indication of how happy your VM is. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, guys.